Hi, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Daniel Ginsberg. I'm the Director of Education and Professional Practice at the American Anthropological Association. Um, and in case you can't see me, a white person with glasses and my hair pulled back, and I'm sitting in front of a bookcase, my pronouns are they, them. Um, I wanna welcome everyone to today's event, which is called Consent-Based Citing, Social Science and Nuclear Waste Management at the US Department of Energy. This webinar is part of the American Anthropological Association's Uh, webinar series, Anthropology Live, a two season. Um, but be sure to check back on AmericanAnthropology.org slash Anthropology Live, where we'll soon be posting the lineup for spring of 2023. Um, and I will put that link into the chat for you um, so you can click on it. The AAA webinars are free and open to the public. Um, and so we want to thank AAA members and donors for supporting our work. If you would like to support this webinar program, we would appreciate your considering a gift to AAA professional development which you can make at the website my.americananthro.org slash donate. And also, if you're not currently a AAA member, you can join at americananthro.org slash join. Now, before we jump into today's program, I have a few quick accessibility reminders. First of all, to maintain a strong signal and to keep the visual display from getting too complicated, I ask everyone who's not speaking to keep your camera and microphone turned off. Um, also, to make this more accessible to everyone, we are providing closed captioning. And I'd like to thank Tammy, our captioner for today. Uh, to turn on captioning, you can move your cursor to the bottom of your screen and click on the CC icon. Uh, if you have any other access needs that aren't being met, you can use the chat to send a direct message to any AAA staff, and we are all labeled as such in the list of attendees. Um, this session is going to begin with a couple of presentations and then end with a Q&A session. Uh, to ask a question, you can open the chat and type in your question. You can put a question into the chat at any time, but we won't be getting to those until the Q&A portion of the program. Um, so that's all by way of housekeeping. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Vincent Iolenti. Dr. Iolenti is a federal manager and social scientist working at the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Integrated Waste Management. He holds a PhD in sociocultural anthropology from Cornell University and an MSc in Law, Anthropology, and Society from the London School of Economics. Prior to his federal service, Vincent was an assistant research professor at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs, and he held fellowships at the University of Southern California and the University of British Columbia. His ethnographic research on nuclear waste management, environmental security, and temporality have been supported by the U.S. National Science Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and the Berggren Institute. Vincent has published with American Ethnologist, MIT Press, Social Studies of Science, Physics Today, Nuclear Technology, the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute, and the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, as well as public outlets such as Scientific American, BBC, NPR, and Forbes. Please welcome him. Yes, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, so as you just heard, yes, hello everyone. I'm Vincent Ilenti social scientist at the US Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy. Um, and to maximize the visual accessibility of this webinar in case uh, some of the people tuning in can't uh, see me, I'm a man in my mid thirties. Uh, I'm sitting in a room with white walls um, uh, with a picture of a mountain in the wilderness hanging in the background. Um, I'm also, uh, as you just heard in uh, Daniel's generous and kind introduction, a cultural anthropologist by training. Um, and the specific DOE office um, that I work in is the Office of Spent Fuel and Waste Disposition. And this is part of the DOE's Office of Nuclear Energy. And our mission is to develop and implement an integrated system to sustainably uh, and responsibly manage uh, the nation's spent nuclear fuel and high-level radioactive waste. We're responsible for R&D related to uh, spent nuclear fuel storage, transportation, and disposition. And um, today I'm going to give, give you a high level overview of our recent consent based siting efforts. I'll outline various ways that our office is acting on public feedback, and I'll tell you about a new funding opportunity, which will help promote mutual learning among key stakeholders, as well as tribal state and local governments. And along the way, I'm going to highlight how we've been integrating social scientists, anthropologists included, um, me being one of them, directly into our efforts. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the Department of Energy's position is that nuclear energy is essential to tackling climate change. After all, it currently provides almost 20% of the United States' electricity and half of our emissions free energy. The current administration has set some ambitious goals. A 50% reduction of carbon emissions by the end of the decade, 100% clean electricity by 2035, and a net zero economy by 2050. But even if you're personally skeptical of nuclear energy's promises, perhaps we can agree on something, the need to pursue a safe, secure, and environmentally just nuclear waste management solution. And this solution isn't just a technical one. It has many social and economic components as well. And at the DOE, this has created many opportunities for co-production in a very multidisciplinary team. This team includes social scientists, procurement specialists, engineers, systems analysts, health physicists, communications professionals, and others at DOE and in, in its supporting national laboratories. Uh, next slide, please. So management of the nation's spent nuclear fuel and high-level radioactive waste is the DOE's responsibility. This includes finding sites to store and dispose of spent nuclear fuel for the long term. In action on this issue, it's already cost taxpayers more than $9 billion in settlements and judgments. And while spent nuclear fuel is stored safely in 70 sites across the country at present, the communities that currently host it never consented to keeping this material in their backyards indefinitely for the long term. And we can't continue to defer this problem. It's our responsibility to those communities to move the spent fuel to an interim storage facility. And the time to start work on that is now. That's why DOE is working towards an integrated waste management system. This system will include one or more consolidated interim storage facilities, the transportation infrastructure necessary for moving spent fuel, and also a permanent disposal pathway. To get there though, we'll need to identify willing and informed host communities to be our partners in this mission. To chart the path forward, DOE is committed to using a consent-based siting approach. Uh, next slide, please. So our current focus um, in, with siting is on siting a federal consolidated interim storage facility. Uh, in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, Congress provided funding uh, for the DOE to move forward with identifying a site using a consent-based siting approach. In 2022, Congress continues to fund these activities. Interim storage will allow for the removal of spent fuel from reactor sites. This will promote new jobs and economic opportunities for host communities while reducing liability to US taxpayers that I mentioned before. And our hope is that siting a federal consolidated interim storage facility using a consent-based siting process will help us rebuild trust and confidence with stakeholders, communities, and the public. The lessons we'll learn from this can be applied to other uh, waste management facilities in the future, such as the ge geologic repository. To that end, we're conducting generic R&D, such as investigating various geological medias and modeling generic repository concepts. Next slide, please. So what am I talking about? What exactly is consent-based siting? Well, it's an approach to siting nuclear waste facilities that makes the needs of people and communities central to the process. It aims to enable broad participation and centers equity and environmental justice. Communities can elect to participate by working collaboratively, collaboratively through a series of steps and phases with the department, the implementing organization, as a partner. Each step and phase will help a community determine whether and how hosting a community is aligned with their goals. And the phases and steps that they're going through are intended to serve as a guide, not a prescriptive set of instructions. Further, we expect that consent-based siting will look different in different communities. This isn't a one-size-fits-all process. And as anthropologists surely know, uh, definitions of consent change across time. In different communities, different people have different notions of consent, and people have different notions of community as well. So that's a discussion we're going to have to have in the coming years, and that's where anthropologists have a lot to value to add. So potential outcomes of a consent-based siting process could include a negotiated consent agreement, defined by the community in collaboration with the department, or a determination that, after exploring all these different options, the community just isn't interested. Fine with us. 
Uh, we consider both of these to be success, uh, successful outcomes in a consent-based citing process. An informed decision not to consent is a fine outcome. So this is quite a challenge, Ed, but we believe consent-based citing is both the right thing to do and our best chance uh, for success. And social science is playing a growing role in refining and implementing the DOE's consent-based citing process. Last summer, for instance, uh, our office, um, Office of Spent Fuel and Waste Disposition, once again, hired three new social scientists. One's a human geographer um, named Marissa Bell, who some of you might know. Um, another is an experimental psychologist, uh, and the other is a cultural anthropologist, uh, and that's me. And the three of us help manage and oversee social science research projects at a variety of different national laboratories which support the DOE. We provide guidance on environmental justice goals and help design outreach and engagement strategies. Social scientists, the DOE and its supporting national labs work in multidisciplinary teams. We shape and design the implementation of consent-based citing process updates and do all sorts of other uh, interesting work as well. Um, let me give you an example, right? So social scientists help inform uh, this recent uh, funding opportunity announcement uh, that will empower local communities uh, through engagement. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit later in this presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So how are we listening to the public or to publics, plural? Well, last December, um, DOE took the first step in moving forward with consent-based citing. We issued a request for information, uh, we'll call it an RFI, on using consent-based siting process to identify sites for interim storage of spent nuclear fuel. It's important to note that this RFI was not seeking communities to volunteer uh, as host sites. That'll come later. Rather, right now, um, at that point rather, uh, we were interested in hearing from the public on a range of different questions. For example, how can we remove barriers to meaningful participation? especially for underserved and unrepresented or underrepresented communities. We ended up receiving 220 submissions from tribal, state, and local governments, as well as a wide range of stakeholders, including NGOs, members of academia, industry, and private citizens. And over several months, social scientists from the national labs that support the DOE uh, helped analyze and summarize this feedback, producing a remarkable report, which I encourage you to check out. Um, some of them, for instance, helped uh, explore these issues uh, through the lens of concepts such as distributive justice or procedural justice. And um, all of the individual comments, all the 220, as well as the comment summary, summary and analysis report, which was facilitated by social scientists, was available on uh, the DOE's website, energy.gov slash consent-based citing. Uh, next slide, please. So DOE takes this public feedback very seriously, and it's informing our actions. So a recurring comment in the RFI, the Request for Information, related to the need to provide funding for public participation in the consent-based signing process. Um, people are busy and funding can help uh, uh, facil facilitate the process of uh, engaging and uh, expressing their views. Um, this slide, uh, which I'll read off for visual accessibility reasons, um, uh, shows two examples of comments like these. For example, a tribal representative told us, quote, funding and technical assistance should be provided to tribes to participate in all stages of the consent-based siting process. Tribes often do not have the same resources, staff capacity, uh, or time as states, so DOE must take proactive steps to ensure that tribes can participate in the process. Similarly, a private citizen requested, quote, extensive outreach activities and financial support for interested communities to learn for themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So how are we taking action on recommendations like this? Well, in September 20th of this year, the Department of Energy, our office, introduced a $16 million funding opportunity to support community engagement, mutual learning, and open dialogue about the consent-based citing process we're working on. And with this funding opportunity, the DOE is not yet soliciting uh, communities to volunteer to host a federal consolidated interim storage facility. The funding simply aims to enable mutual learning and help build capacity 
fostering the development of uh, innovative community ideas and feedback. We're investing in relationships. We're investing in conversations. The funding will be distributed among 68 awardees and the tasks are expected to be completed over the course of 18 to 24 months. Eligible entities include tribal, state, and local governments, universities, academics can apply, NGOs, think tanks, community colleges, municipalities, regional planning organizations, and so on. And we're focusing on diversity among the awardees, both geographically as well as institutionally, because we want to see a a diverse range of representation of perspectives in the cohort of awardees. So special considerations will also be given to, uh, you know, values and principles of environmental justice, transparency of activities, and inclusiveness. Applications for this are due on December 19th, and they must be sent via email. Um, again, you can find more information about this on the website, energy.gov slash consent based siting. Next slide, please. So the funding awardees will represent what we're calling a consent-based siting consortium. What's that? Well, that's a group that facilitates engagement and dialogue activities. Awardees don't need to be located in or near an interested community, a community that wants to learn more. After all, we're not yet looking for a site. Some of the applications um, might be from organizations that rep represent the interest of multiple communities also. So awardees, whoever they turn out to be, um, hopefully a diverse coalition, will serve as dialogue facilitators to provide communities with resources for learning more about consent-based siting and consolidated interim storage. The funding opportunity will allow awardees to issue grants to interested communities as well. So there will be sub-awardees underneath the awardees that we're giving these awards to. Our hope is that this structure will reduce barriers for participation in the consent-based siting process. Here's why. We fully appreciate that uh, government procurement processes and applications to funding opportunities can be complex, complicated, and time-consuming. It's not a short application. So individual communities are certainly, certainly eligible to apply, um, but we understand there's a burden um, associated with this application. So by having other sorts of awardees also available um, um, uh, to uh, apply for this, um, we're trying to create a cohort or a coalition um, that a consortia that will have wider reach in the department in any given community, ultimately helping to build greater mutual understanding and capacity. This is where the multiplication factor comes in. These awardees can serve as place-based anchors for engaging more diverse uh, sets of stakeholders. The funding is going to leverage the awardees institutional capacity and can provide assistance um, to interested communities um, they, for instance, like third party technical assistants or subject matter experts, right? So the department will be a partner in this process the whole way, available to share technical information, communications, materials, and other resources. Next slide, please. So what do the awardees do? Well, let's divide it into three major areas, right? So first, awardees will organize, lead, and maintain meaningful and inclusive community and stakeholder engagement processes related to nuclear waste management. Second, awardees will elicit and map public values, interests, concerns, and goals to promote and enable effective collaboration, community-driven insights, and feedback towards the refinement of our consent-based signing process. We want our awardees to help us refine how this all works. And then three, awardees will develop, implement, and report outcomes and strategies that help support mutual learning among DOE officials, stakeholders, communities, and experts on nuclear waste related topics. Next slide, please. So that's our vision and that's where we are now. So what are our next steps and where are we going? Well, we're refining uh, the draft consent based siting process and we'll be making it available uh, online publicly and it's ready in due course. We're gonna be awarding cooperative agreements to, uh, to funding opportunity awardees in new year, next year, and making um, uh, every attempt to work closely with them in the process to stimulate this type of engagement. And we're continuing to learn from public feedback along the way. We wanna hear from 
tribal, state, local governments, NGOs, think tanks, all sorts of different um, entities and stakeholders and partners and other nations, uh, international partners as well, and refine this process to make it as good as possible, as equitable as possible, and as just as possible. And benefiting from this really multidisciplinary team that I'm on, we'll be drawing from a wide range of social science perspectives and then seeing how they can influence what's usually um, a complex technical process. Uh, let's approach this more as a socio-technical process. Next slide, please. So to conclude, DOE's consent-based citing effort is focused on the broad inclusion of diverse thoughts and voices to enable mutual learning. Our efforts are important steps towards developing a fair and inclusive process for identifying sites for federal consolidated interim storage. And DOE is committed to a process that enables broad participation and centers equity and environmental justice. Along the way, social scientists like anthropologists will play an important role in helping achieve that goal. By prioritizing communities and people, DOE believes it can find solutions to the decades long nuclear waste stalemate that we all find ourselves in. And again, we're not yet looking for a site yet. Um, we're just looking to invest in relationships and start this broader dialogue. And we hope that pretty much everyone on this call, um, uh, we invite you in to uh, participate in these conversations and help us refine our consent-based siting process as well. So that's all for now. Um, thanks for this. And I, uh, I really think this is an amazing webinar series. And I really look forward to listening to uh, Dr. Li Bao um, about his experiences working with the DOE um, throughout his career. So thank you very much for your time and, and thank you. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, th this is Ed Li Bao. I am the executive director of the American Anthropological Association. Uh, and in case you can't uh, see me, I'm an older white guy with a bald head and glasses, trim beard and blue shirt. I'm sitting in my office at the uh, association headquarters in suburban uh, Washington. Uh, I want to just spend a few minutes offering some personal reflections for the benefit of the social scientists in the audience here, uh, particularly those of you who might have some skepticism about working with the Department of Energy. Based on my own personal history, um, uh, I believe that there is a terrific opportunity here uh, for meaningful, impactful opportunity uh, to be in the room where it happens. Apologies to Hamilton. Um, so, so let me just uh, uh, take a little trip down memory lane and uh, reflect on uh, work that I did uh, before I joined the American Anthropological Association staff 10 years ago. Uh, I began working with the Department of Energy in the mid 1980s, moving back and forth between site specific work involving the Hanford area in southeastern Washington state and the national headquarters here in the other Washington, that is Washington, DC. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Hanford, uh, it's an area that once comprised almost 600 square miles of high desert uh, bisected by the Columbia River just upstream from uh, where the Snake River uh, runs into the Columbia, occupying and adjacent to territories that were ceded in a series of 1855 treaties with the Yakima Indian Nation, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, um, and the Nez Perce Tribe. Uh, the treaty tribes retained the right to hunt and fish at usual and accustomed places in these ceded territories. Uh, but in the 1940s, the Hanford area was cordoned off to make way for manufacturing weapons grade plutonium as part of the top secret Manhattan project. Uh, it eventually became home to a total of nine defense reactors that were lined up along the Columbia River uh, to take advantage of the river as a source of uh, cooling water, uh, as well as one 
operating commercial power plant, um, a research and development facility operated by my employer, the Battelle Memorial Institute, uh, and a remarkable volume of highly contaminated radioactive and other hazardous chemical waste byproducts of the weapons manufacturing activities. Most of these defense manufacturing activities had stopped by the early 1970s, uh, and the last remaining facility uh, uh, closed in 1989. Uh, the, the one commercial power reactor uh, continues to operate, as do site cleanup activities and the research laboratory, the Pacific Northwest National Lab. Uh, now, my work at Hanford had two braided strands to it, uh, both involving consultation and collaboration with the tribes that share an interest in the land, as well as the air and watersheds that were contaminated by the Cold War activities. Uh, one strand of this work involved investigating the uh, social, cultural, economic impacts of uh, building a deep underground storage facility in the basalt rock that lies beneath the Hanford area to which commercial power plant fuel might be transported from the more than 70 sites around the country uh, where the fuel, as, as Vincent told us, um, is now stored in stainless steel line swimming pools. Hanford was eventually eliminated from the search for a permanent geological repository site. Um, and that's a subject we can return to in the Q&A if you like. Um, the, the other strand of my work uh, with the nine tribes of the upper Columbia River Basin um, involved uh, uh, helping the tribes to enhance their capacity uh, to document, interpret, mitigate the adverse health effects of the air and waterborne contamination that was released uh, both accidentally and in the normal course of weapons grade fuel manufacture um, at the Hanford area. Um, the nine tribes include, uh, I'm, let's see, I'll go clockwise from the north, uh, the Spokane, Colville, Kalispell, Kootenai of Northern Idaho, and Coeur d'Alene tribes, which are located downwind and to the north and east of Hanford, um, and primarily affected by years of airborne releases of radioactive iodine. Uh, and then the Yakima, Nez Perce, Umatilla, and Warm Springs uh, tribes, whose usual and accustomed fishing areas were affected mainly by uh, downstream flows of a variety of radioactive chemicals. Uh, iodine is absorbed in humans in the thyroid gland, the master regulator of the hormone system, um, and thyroid disease can lead to a variety of secondary health um, effects. Uh, in the downstream contamination flow of greatest concern uh, were uh, strontium and cesium, which both emulate calcium, and when absorbed by the body, are taken up uh, by the bone, especially through fish consumption and, and drinking water, they can lead to bone and blood cancers. Um, I was not the only anthropologist who was involved in this Hanford health work. And the period I'm talking about is from 1985 to 2012. Uh, I've written a summary of this work that's in a chapter of a book edited by Barbara Rose Johnston, uh, published by the School of Advanced Research on Cold War legacies. Uh, but today, I'd like to say that at the time, uh, the department had the wisdom to recognize that for the results of this work to be credible, it needed to authorize the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry um, to oversee the health effects research. And it also needed to create a meaningful oversight role uh, for a, a steering committee appointed by the governors of the states in the region. Uh, although not without its friction points, uh, I believe that the department's experience uh, gained from decades of consultation and collaboration with the tribal and state governments uh, set a productive organizational framework for the process uh, that we've heard Vincent 
uh, described uh, just now. Uh, the, the second category of work I'd like to very briefly mention um, involves our uh, support for the department's headquarters. Uh, some of you may know that in 1994, President Clinton issued a presidential memorandum uh, calling on each federal agency to establish a set of policies for government to government consultation and cooperation with tribal governments. It was subsequently followed by an executive order with the same directive. And incidentally, just yesterday, President Biden issued an update on that executive order. Um, I had the privilege of working with the staff of the Deputy Assistant Secretaries for Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs and Environmental Management in developing the Department of Energy's uh, policies to comply with President Clinton's uh, memorandum and the executive order. Um, and this process of developing the policy itself involved extensive consultations with specific tribal governments, as well as uh, national intertribal organizations, uh, such as the National Congress of American Indians and the Council of Energy Resource Tribes. Um, test beds for the government to government consultations then became the Hanford area's uh, Richland field office. Uh, the National Transportation Planning uh, for the Transuranic Waste Interim Storage Project that's known as uh, the Waste Isolation Pilot Project in Southern New Mexico um, and the impact assessment work uh, associated with uh, high level waste transportation uh, from these dispersed commercial power plants around the country uh, to the hypothetical Yucca Mountain Repository, where many of the highway and rail routes to this possible destination would have had to cross tribal lands and generate uh, a need for uh, beefed up public safety and emergency preparedness planning. Again, I, I believe that the agency's experience uh, gained from this extensive consultation and collaboration uh, has added a productive organizational framework for the consent-based siting process that we've just heard about. Uh, I, I'll stop here with the observation that the mission of the American Anthropological Association uh, is to advance our collective understanding of the human condition uh, and to apply this advanced understanding to tackling some of the world's most pressing problems. Climate change and the accompanying social production of vulnerabilities are foremost among these problems. And I believe it would be both a privilege and a responsibility for us to use our training uh, in facing these problems head on. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, and I believe we'll now turn our attention uh, to your uh, questions and comments. If you uh, don't want to turn your cameras and microphones on, you're welcome to um, add your uh, uh, observations or, or questions um, for Vincent or myself um, into the meeting chat. Sure. And uh, it looks like we have one. Uh, but first, I'd like to also just, um, you know, first of all, thanks, Ed, for that uh, extremely uh, vivid and uh, textured and thoughtful and reflective uh, retrospective on your career and working with a lot of the problems that I hear about daily and a lot of the entities um, that I hear about daily in my uh, four months working at uh, DOE so far. So thank you so much for that. And I, I totally agree with your uh, view that um, there's a place for anthropology and improving how we do this. And 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 it's, it's something that was built up over time, um, over decades with other people doing consultation hearings and collaborative projects with us. So thank you so much. And the other aspect I'd like to point out is everything you just described uh, pointed to the importance of having an interdisciplinary team. I actually um, wanted to have some of my colleagues uh, uh, here. So I have uh, actually on this call uh, also as uh, Natalia Sarieva, who's the team lead uh, for consent-based siting um, in our department and Juan Uribe, who's a pro senior program manager, he's an engineer. So if people have technical questions about um, how this is gonna work or 
uh, sort of a deeper technicalities. They, they were instrumental to, uh, I don't want to take credit for the FOA, I've only been here for four months, but deeper technical questions about the funding opportunity announcement. Um, you can pitch questions to them as well, or I can just hand it off to them. But it looks like Maxine Polari has a comment. Uh, so I'd love to hear what that is. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Vincent and Hed, for uh, your talk. It was uh, very much appreciated. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Maxime Pollery. I'm a, an assistant professor at uh, Laval University in Quebec. And uh, I've been working in the Fukushima nuclear disaster and also on the uh, concern-based setting of nuclear waste in Canada. And I've got a question for, for both of you uh, regarding uh, head comments about the skepticism of leaving academia for industry or for uh, local or federal governments. Um, I also have students that are coming to me and saying, uh, what I'm going to do after my, my PhD or after my master, uh, there is basically no tenure track jobs, uh, there is no jobs with any security whatsoever. So sometimes I'm telling them, well, have you considered, for instance, going to uh, outside of academia, working for industry or working for the government? And, you know, like you said, there's always this kind of skepticism of, you know, leaving academia, something like, well, if I do this, I'm going to have wasted, you know, 10 or 15 years of my life. So regarding this, I was wondering, um, what has been some of your, like, biggest challenge into trying to keep your anthropological uh, viewpoint, trying to keep your critical hedge that uh, has been afforded by a long time of studying things, while also working for a non-academic uh, institution that can have you know, its own pressure regarding things that can be said or its own pressure regarding how independence is understood. Uh, so I'm guessing it's a question for both of you for Head that has a long time experience in this, and also for Vincent, which has been switching to both different contexts in a shorter time span. Thank you. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, thank you. That's a really important question. Um, I'll say that you know uh, people make a very big deal in uh, in academia about leaving academia, and as if this is some. Uh, major life choice and that all the friends and relationships and uh, wonderful conversations you're having before will somehow stop. Uh, I haven't found this to be the case working for the federal government. Uh, for instance, I, you know, I mean, if you want to be around a bunch of PhDs, if that's your prerogative, well, you know, there's loads of them at the Department of Energy. And, uh, you know, working with this are national laboratories, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, Sandia National Laboratory, um, you know, uh, several others. And, um, there's loads of people doing fascinating research, even social science research uh, around us every day. Some of the work packages I manage are looking at the values and stakeholder perspectives of uh, communities that currently host uh, radioactive waste. And what's interesting about it is, well, now that I work for the DOE, I can translate that into action, right? Um, I also oversee uh, sort of communications and outreach work packages that uh, integrate some of the perspectives from social science and then turn them into uh, more sensitive and more empathetic and uh, uh, more uh, culturally and historically situated engagement strategies. So it hasn't been as much of a leap as I, I thought it would be. Also, um, there are restrictions on how you can publish uh, with general counsel and things like that. Eventually, you get something worked out and you can publish on the side. You're probably going to be, gonna have to go through general counsel. There's restrictions there. You can still publish, though. Uh, and then finally, um, the biggest challenge, uh, I would say that people don't really know what social science is necessarily when you're in an institution, um, you kind of have to describe it to them. Uh, for instance, like uh, everyone knows the difference between, you know, a plasma physicist and, a, um, you know, a biologist or like an ecologist and uh, 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 an engineer and a procurement specialist, but they might not know the difference between a geographer or an experimental psychologist or a cultural anthropologist or an archeologist or something like that. So kind of coming up with a language to translate your expertise um, to other people and trying to find those points of collaboration where you can uh, find the way you can add value and have the greatest amount of impact. That's something that I think that an anthropologist going into government has to kind of take on for themselves. That's our task. Uh, 
I'm working to do it, but honestly, I don't think it was the tremendous leap um, that a lot of people imagine it to be. And I, I strongly encourage other people to uh, take this route themselves. So what do you think, Ed? Uh, I, I agree with everything you say. I'm not sure I have much to add to this. I, I will say um, I, I have never had a job in the academy. I went straight from my graduate program uh, to working for Battelle. Uh, and, and my view is that um, uh, if you're going to effectively tackle complicated policy problems, you better have the right problem to start with. Um, that problem structuring is the most important part about solving policy problems. And when you think about it, your graduate training in anthropology um, re reflects your ability to formulate and carry out a complicated research project about um, an original problem that you try to solve in an innovative way. And I believe that those skills are directly transferable uh, to the policy arena, especially in the early problem structuring stages of that work. And as Vincent says, the opportunity uh, to work alongside um, uh, biochemists and health physicists and epidemiologists uh, just uh, and medical geographers just r rocks your world. Um, uh, so, so I think that the, th this is a good time for anthropology, um, as long as we have an expansive view about the opportunities that are out there and the ways in which our training can be of direct relevance um, uh, in these important policy domains. Strongly agree. And it looks like uh, Hugh Gusterson has a, has a question now, doesn't he? Hi there, nice to, to see you both, Denny and, uh, and Ed. Um, so, my, and it was a fascinating talk, thank you very much. Um, my question has to do with the proposed repository itself. It's an interim repository, right? So my wife, Alison McFarlane, who I think Vinnie knows, uh, and I have been um, doing a study of an Australian nuclear waste siting process. And it's proposed that they would take nuclear waste from Australia's only nuclear reactor, a research reactor in Sydney, and temporarily store it pending um, the development of longer term disposition plans. And what we found is that the people who are being invited to host this facility wonder if temporary actually is a euphemism for permanent. Or, you know, maybe there is an intention that one day there'll be a permanent repository, but that relies on some other community putting its hand up and agreeing to be that permanent repository. So if I lived in a proposed interim repository site, the first question on my mind would be, how can you promise me that this is really interim? Yes, um, good. Um, first of all, thank you, Hugh, for your question. Uh, can always rely on you for uh, uh, um, a difficult and incisive question. So that was, this is fantastic. So um, I'll say uh, that the current situation we have uh, is not not where we need to be. There's waste in 70 sites across the US, I believe in over 30 states, maybe there over 34 states actually. Um, the taxpayer liability, because the <laughs> because um, the federal government and the Department of Energy uh, failed to meet its obligations um, in 1998 to have a final solution um, for uh, uh, permanent disposal. Um, has created a, a situation where there's a taxpayer liability. People are paying so far $9 billion. Um, and eventually it's projected over $30 billion to keep waste in these 70 different sites across the country. And each one has redundant, um, redundant um, sort of security and infrastructure and um, uh, different uh, technolo technological apparatuses at each point um, that are being paid for individually. Um, so currently we're in that situation is what I would like to underscore. Like currently 70 places have not consented for this to be here for the long term. Uh, they haven't consented for it to be there indefinitely. 
So the idea here is to remove it from 70 places that have not consented and find a place that will consent. And we realize we have to go slow on this. We have to do this 18 to 24 month period of engagement, talking, talking to the critics, talking to people who ask difficult questions like that one, uh, working on legislative changes for the uh, to permanent disposal pathway, um, and trying to be in frank and open and honest about this as possible. Uh, but eventually, uh, our office is uh, seeking a permanent disposal pathway, and uh, we're uh, going to keep people updated on this. Um, I'd actually like to ask uh, Natalia Sarajeva, if she's on this line, if she has anything to add to that, because she's on the consent-based siting team. Uh, Natalia, would you like to add something to that? Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vincent, and uh, thank you, Hugh, for this uh, really good question, really important question. We uh, actually have heard a lot of um, similar concerns uh, through our request for information, through the comments we received, that uh, it's one of the concerns that uh, siting of an interim storage facility will be difficult because right now there is no uh, clear uh, identified pathway to uh, a repository in the United States. And there is a fear uh, that a host community might be afraid to be a host because they may think they might become, uh, as you said, uh, a host for longer than they expected. So as Vincent mentioned, we're working on the integrated waste management strategy that includes the pathway for the repository. Uh, also, uh, we uh, the uh, the um, the length of the uh, how the storage will operate will also be uh, negotiated with the host community, which could uh, potentially help the elevate elevate those concerns just in case if at that time we are not working on citing uh, a, a deep geological repository, but hope, um, hopefully that uh, status quo will change. Thank you, Natalia, that was really valuable. Looks like we have another question from uh, Makoto Takahashi. Hi there, thank you for um, those really, really interesting talks. Um, and it's great to see um, uh, so many members of the community uh, in the Q&A as well. Um, so I wanted to follow up on um, Ed's comment on getting the problem right. And I wanted to hear a bit more from you both about what the consent in consent based citing is. Um, and so in particular, in the eyes of the DOE or the US policy establishment more generally, what does it mean for a community to consent? You know, how do you know who the community is, how the boundaries of that drawn, um, and what mechanism um, of consent is being used here? Um, you know, is it a referendum? Is it the assent of representatives? Um, you know, what, what's kind of informing the concept of consent uh, in this framework? Ed, would you like to answer that or do you want me to give it a shot? Uh, well, I, I can talk about it in the abstract, but not in the immediate context of the department's consent-based citing framework so let me let me just talk in the abstract and and i love the the question so thank you for posing that there are a number of different models of consent that uh, prevail in different communities around the uh, uh, around the country and this is also a source of friction i think because some people say it's not consent unless there is unanimity um, and others say no plurality rules that's our principle of consent if there's just one more person on one side of an issue as opposed to another then that constitutes uh, consent and then others will say no it's the you know the voice of authority whether it's elders in the community or it's our elected officials they they are put there to lead and they will tell us um, how to um, uh, how to proceed with this. And so at, at any given time, in any given community, we may actually have multiple and competing views of what constitutes um, a consensus and a consent-based outcome. Um, and and this is, uh, th th this is a, a super important principle, I think, to have established um, at the outset. Yes, and I would like to add that, you know, at least with our program, consent-based citing, uh, you know, this, the reason we did this RFI, this, you know, is to hear the public feedback, was to start to try to create a discussion about this. What is, what is consent? What is a community? 
um, how does a community show uh, express consent uh, and what does that mean what principles and at what point do we get to a negotiated settlement agree uh, consent agreement uh, for the community so that's what I think the next 18 to 24 months uh, for this funding opportunity are about to have these conversations with communities to say hey what does consent mean to you and who is the community who speaks for the community who are the you know is it the VIPs in the community like the rich business people and you know the uh, city council that decides or something, or is it a vote? Is it a referendum? Uh, these are discussions communities um, have to have. Is this something that DOE decides because it wants to be uniformly applied? Is this something that comes from the ground up organically? These are the discussions we need to have with our uh, collaboration um, consortia that we're putting together. Um, so yeah, we're really sensitive to that. That's why we ha we're hiring, you know, legions of social scientists at the National Labs and uh, also a couple in uh, our office as well to sort of have these difficult questions, which are probably, um, you know, don't have an answer, uh, but we can try to get a better answer and uh, make some significant prog progress in this direction. I'll also add that, you know, definitions of consent change over time. And when you're dealing with uh, communities that, um, you know, are possibly hosting waste for, uh, you know, um, significant amount of time, decades, or with permanent disposal, it's there for even longer, you know, consent shifts over time. Um, we're sensitive to that. Being open, honest, and transparent with the community when talking about these things is essential. Um, if you look at other countries, for instance, and how they've done this that are more advanced in the pro, uh, further along in the process, it comes out that, you know, it can't be one size fits all. Uh, for instance, maybe in one community, consent will be defined this way, maybe in another community, consent will be defined that way, but applying an anthropological sensibility of seeing what local definitions of consent are is the first step. And that's what these next 18 uh, to 24 months are about. And once we get that, then we can start going from who goes where uh, and how consent is if achieved. I, um, if I may uh, also just take a, another trip down memory lane, some of you who are familiar with the history of uh, the department and its search for a solution here may remember um, the, the concept of monitored retrievable storage and the office of the nuclear waste negotiator who was seeking um, a community that would step forward and host a monitored retrievable storage um, site. This was back 30 some years ago. Um, and, and they actually managed to identify um, a community that was willing to host it. It happened to be um, a tribal uh, nation in Utah. Uh, Go shoot. That, pardon me? Was it Go shoot? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so, so they they said um, we recognize that there's a trade-off between national interests and local burdens. We will, under certain circumstances, be willing to undertake this. It is in the national interest, um, and we can see that there may be some local benefit that comes from it as well, if certain health, safety, and emergency preparedness conditions can be met. The state of Utah, however, said, uh-uh, no way, that's not going to happen. Um, and, and this was um, a, a super important lesson for the need to have um, social scientists involved in this discussion, because mm -hmm. these decisions, these citing decisions, don't take place in um, a historical or cultural vacuum and understanding the history of state tribal relations in the American West was absolutely essential to predicting the outcome of the Office of Nuclear Waste Negotiators um, uh, efforts at, at seeking uh, uh, an account like this. So that's not uh, an answer to a question, but it points us towards some processes that will be um, essential in um, in trying to uh, reach some outcomes. Very eloquently put. Um, looks like we're getting towards the end. Uh, how about a DD Verma? Um, here from the science side of things, we call that a lot of anthropologists, so. <laughs> thank you, Vincent, and thank you, Ed. Those were really interesting talks. Um, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of excitement even and momentum around finding potential sites for, uh, for an interim storage facility and also an ultimate repository. But as you both rightly pointed out, there are communities across the country who have been impacted um, by the activities of the DOE or 
they've been impacted in that they have effectively stored waste for much longer than they signed up for. Um, and many of these are tribal communities um, as, well, as well. And so I guess what I'm wondering is how, you know, how do you and how does the DOE think about acknowledging uh, and potentially repairing the impacts to, to those communities? How do you think about looking back? Uh, and, and what does, you know, as, since you've been sort of focusing on equity and environmental justice, what does that mean uh, to, to those communities? And will you seek to engage with them uh, in this process of consent-based siting? Thank you for that. Uh, yes, <laughs> one of the big recommendations or one of the recommendations in the um, um, request for information we did was to do listening sessions. Uh, and we heard from, you know, uh, and uh, to hold, that's what, we, you know, that's precisely what we're trying to achieve with this funding opportunity announcement, right? So, you know, I, I don't know what the awardees are going to submit. Perhaps they'll host citizen assemblies, perhaps they'll host town halls, perhaps they'll host uh, uh, meetings with subject matter experts, perhaps they'll set it up in various different ways. There's gonna be six to eight of them, uh, 1 million to 2 million each. And um, we're hoping to host conversations precisely along those lines. What what do people want? What do people wanna see? What 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 conversations do we have to have first? whether it's about um, you know, the legacy of Navajo uranium mining, for instance, um, what conversation that was mentioned in the RFI, what conversations do we have to have about other things the Department of Energy has, or the Atomic Energy Commission in the past uh, have done uh, and that have disproportionately benefited some communities and disproportionately harmed other communities. And I think that going through these conversations in this context of this, con this consortia, getting the critical people there, getting communities who really, and probably rightly, I mean, there's a huge compensation effort I'm sure you've seen for, uh, for uh, Manhattan Project and everything. So DOE is well aware <laughs> of our legacy. And we are also well aware of the amount of distrust and mistrust in our activities. Um, and that's something different. I can say as an anthropologist, to go back to some of these earlier questions of, it's a lot different when I engage with people, you know, as a friendly guy in a notebook saying I'm the nuclear waste anthropologist. The second I say I'm a Fed working for the DOE, suddenly I'm hearing all these stories of very real historical suffering and injustice and sadness. Other, other, you know, next next thing I hear like a policy, someone's, you know, um, you know, um, at the gym, someone's telling me, you know, uh, what's with this electric car stuff? Why are they getting rid of the nuclear power plants? Coal is not that bad, blah, blah, blah. You know, so it's like suddenly people, uh, the tenor raises when you're in this sort of position. Um, so that's something I'm trying to grapple with too. Um, um, I like listening to people. I am an ethnographer. I wanna hear what all the different perspectives is. For me, it's about reading all sorts of ethnographies. It's about pulling underserved communities into this funding opportunity announcement collaboration consortia. It's about making sure everyone voices what they have to say first, and then we make the argument. Then we say, here is why it could benefit your community. But I don't think we can go to a community that feels that they've had this situation, um, these negative impacts to them, and this felt this pain, and has this level of mistrust, and then make our argument, make our case, until we've had that discussion first, right? About where are we coming from and where do we want to go next? So that's what I'll have to say to that. Um, can I fix it as one anthropologist staff member at the Department of Energy? No. Um, but I think that these conversations in the coming years, which I hope you're part of, um, are going to help us uh, change it a little bit and then get people in a place where they're more comfortable um, and then make the argument because that's what respect means. It means listening, mutual learning, collaboration. Thank you. <laughs> and I think we're over actually. <laughs> <laughs>